Hi, so welcome uh, everyone to the MIT Faculty Forum. I'm Susan Phillips and I'll serve as your moderator today. Um, just a brief, brief background about myself. I'm an energy and environment reporter at WHYY in Philadelphia. That's the NPR station here. And I'm also a member of NPR's energy and environment team. Um, my connection to MIT is that I was a night science journalism fellow back in 2013, 2014. Um, best year of my life, gotta say. Um, as a reminder, uh, we do welcome your questions during this chat. Um, for MIT alumni who are joining us via Zoom, uh, you can use the Q&A feature that is found on your toolbar down at the bottom. For all others listening in on YouTube, um, you can add your questions to the comments field. And we also encourage everyone to tweet using the hashtag MIT Better World. That's MIT Better World. So, and we're also gonna get to as many questions as we can. Um, and I'm really, really excited uh, to hear from our two panelists today. Our two experts will share some of their current research on energy efficiency and innovations in the home and workplace. Um, and what I'm gonna have you guys do um, is, you know, do an overview, um, catch us up on what you've been doing since your time at, at MIT, and then talk about your current projects. Uh, we're gonna start with John Donnell. He's an assistant professor at the US Navy Academy. I'm sorry, the US Naval Academy. And then after that, um, we're going to hear from Pete Schwartz, and he's a professor at Cal Poly. So, uh, John, uh, take it away. All right. Well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, excited to be a part of the panel. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess so. A little bit about myself, because I think it kind of informs uh, my research angle. I got my uh, undergraduate degree from Princeton um, in electrical engineering and did that with an ROTC scholarship. So uh, after graduation, I joined the Army and spent four years doing that stuff um, and I've deployed to Iraq for a year and then decided that actually I enjoyed academia a little bit better and uh, came to MIT where I got my PhD uh, again in electrical engineering um, and got uh, graduated in 2016 and then came here to the Naval Academy where I've been since. Um, so a lot of my work um, is closely coupled to um, applications that are relevant to the to the Army and the Navy, but um, also de definitely uh, in the house and uh, energy efficiency pieces. So um, I guess I'll, I'll um, just dive right into the topics here, or is it let uh, Peter introduce himself or how? I would say go right on. Go All right. right. Go right well, thanks, ahead. Thanks. I'll, I'll just keep talking the floor. So um, yeah, so I guess I'll just show you one of the big things I work on is power monitoring. Um, and so what I mean by that, uh, you're looking at uh, line voltages, like, so this is uh, something you might cut down from uh, the telephone poles in the street, right? Don't do that. But if you did, this is what it would look like. You have some very solid conductors in here. Um, and uh, the nice thing, if you could get access to this is by monitoring the current voltage, um, you can really get eyes on a lot of the appliances in a home business or, or even military facility because nearly everything we have, right, is electronic. Um, and even if it isn't electronic, if it's like a gas furnace, it still uses blowers and control pieces that, that do consume, um, you know, voltage and currents. So we can track a lot and diagnose a lot of problems just by looking at electricity. Um, the problem is, is, of course, well, how do you get into this safely, right? Usually you have to cut the power to the building, get an electric, train an electrician out there. And by the time you've done that, um, you know, you've incurred a significant cost that you might not recoup for quite a while uh, based on the efficiency savings. Um, and in some cases on a ship or an army base, it's just not going to be possible to cut the power. So what I've designed as part of my PhD work is a uh, non-contact sensor that can uh, measure the electromagnetic fields that are outside of a power line. And all you need to do is simply zip tie this to the outside, right? And then uh, using some calibration algorithms, this thing can actually learn um, uh, the magnetic field relationship and tell you uh, all three phases and voltages in, in the line. And we can actually sample it at quite high resolutions and get um, uh, transients that correspond to lows in the house um, and identify them as such. So it's, it's pretty cool. Um, I guess uh, I will show you a quick, uh, some applications of this. Um, and I'll try to share my screen and see if this works. I've been practicing. Um, okay, so uh, 
let's see if we go to here, right? So this is um, sort of a CAD rendering of the fields that you might see on a power line as well as the sensor itself. Uh, and the nice thing when you are making contact, right? We don't sort of worried about the actual values of the volts. In fact, you know, something would be quite dangerous and expensive instrument, we can simply uh, put uh, some extra space between our sensor and the line, <laughs> like with cardboard, really, right? And here you can see the orange line is our sensor and the blue line is a commercial differential probe measuring the same uh, high power transmission line coming up, ramping up from zero volts all the way to, uh, you know, well over five kilovolts. Um, and so we can provide a huge dynamic range, right, without changing the hardware architecture of the sensor. Um, so that provides us some unique opportunities. Uh, so I, at the Naval Academy, I've, I've put this um, on some of the ships that, that are here uh, in the yard that are used for training. So that's a picture on the, on the lower left here. And um, these are not like by any means uh, state-of-the-art vessels, right? These are, these are used for training and don't have any of the modern sensor architecture that you'd see on, on modern warfighters. So um, they still need to understand what's going on in the engine room. They just don't have any of the sensors to tell them. So what I've done is retrofitted right, my power monitoring system onto one of the main power lines here. And so it just zip ties in. Um, this is a slightly different geometry, right? But it's the same, same, same uh, science. And what we can get is uh, three phase uh, power monitoring uh, in real time, right, um, for the whole ship. So this is everything the ship's doing electrically. Uh, and what's particularly interesting about these ships is that they are unable to uh, parallel their uh, power between the shore and the generator. So when they go underway, they actually have to cut power to the ship briefly. And those blackout events are seen as these little power gaps. Um, and so I just present this as kind of an overview of what you might see if, from one of these power meters. Um, and you're right off the bat, not doing any particular machine learning or anything, you know, clever science, right? We can see there's an issue, right? Before the ship goes out, we're using this kind of power. The ship goes underway and doesn't turn off their equipment, right? So you can immediately gain some situational awareness um, it, that can help the crew right away to say, hey, before you guys go home for the night, just check the power meter and make sure that you're roughly around where the baseline you want to be, right? So. Uh, Low-hanging fruit here, um, and the YPs are now, you know, much more energy conscious, and it can also reduce the wear and tear on their equipment. Um, and uh, yeah, so we've done this for uh, over the whole summer, right? We can see several different cruises, and um, this is kind of zoomed out, right? And and at this level, it really looks like hatch. Yeah. So this is from July through August, basically the whole summer of YP 692s electrical consumption. Um, but we're measuring this at, at quite a high frequency. And so we can zoom in here and just look at a slice of the data now. And you can see that it actually resolves nicely into particular transients that correspond to the machinery turning on and off. So now we're just at one hour and this hash is resolved into discrete transients. And if we zoom in further, these transients, now we're at one minute, right? Um, and at one minute, now these transients have enough characteristic, enough flavor that we can apply some machine learning algorithms to actually identify these and track them over time. And that's really where we deliver actionable insights to the crew by saying, hey, that's the chill water pump. And we expect it to you know, only run at the beginning of a cruise. Yours is running every hour. You know, maybe that indicates that a bearing has gone bad or that the pressure sensor on the system is not, is not functioning correctly. Uh, we can even go down to the uh, you know, sub-line cycle for, um, resolution here. And so now you can actually see the uh, harmonic characteristics of the current. And so this can help the crew diagnose issues with uh, poorly performing generators or um, Power electronic loads that are uh, hurting the ship's um, uh, electrical system. Uh, so quite a lot of information, again, just from a few magnetic sensors zip tied to the, uh, to the outside of the power line. Um, and uh, let's see, I, uh, I'll, I'll quickly go through this just as another kind of application on, on how this can be useful. This is a army side of the house, but this can be applied basically anywhere you have a facility with a fixed energy budget. Um, and we put this on uh, a power panel for um, a training site. And this is you know, the energy the unit used uh, while they performed an exercise over the weekend. Uh, so before they were there, not a whole lot of energy. After they left, not a whole lot of energy. While they were there, you know, something's going on, right? But in, th in this kind of resolution is something you might see from a power meter, right? A smart meter that you might install in your house that does like maybe one minute sampling. So clearly we're using energy, but we can't really tell what kind of energy that is. And, and we really need to sample faster. Um, but as I've shown you, right, we, we can actually resolve these into discrete transients. And when we do that, we can actually identify um, what's going on um, in, in this power spectrum. Uh, and so one thing we can look at is water uh, consumption, right? Because this is a Ford operating base. They don't have um, you know, uh, plumbing, so they have to use pumps to pull in their water. And we can actually track whether the base is occupied and where the uh, soldiers are based on how often those water pumps run. And so we can actually ask the system to now apply it uh, water pump usage over time, right? And now in this plot, now we can start to see, yes, they arrived here, 
they woke up around uh, 530. Their plan was to wake up at five. They slept in a little bit. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> and then they, uh, they ended up leaving here in the middle of the day for the range. But if we go back, you, you don't really see that drop in energy here. So what's going on, right? Why are we still consuming energy? And it turns out these are all heaters. These are 10 heaters. And they didn't turn on the thermostats before they left. Um, and so that's interesting, but only in the sense that is it actionable information? Like, is that going to change the way the army operates if we can tell them, hey, your thermostats are set too high? So we can actually have our system go back in time to a you know, similar day where there's uh, similar weather conditions, right? Because we can't shut off everything. We can say, hey, what, is a, what does a baseline camp look like without occupants? Um, and let's compare that to what you did on Saturday. And when we do that, right? We find that the gap, the difference in energy is, is, is quite large, right? 209 kilowatt hours, which corresponds in gallons of fuel, right? Which is an army metric that they're quite uh, you know, aware of, right? This is an extra fuel convoy, right? Coming out um, to, to, re, to resupply a forward base. So if we can save 60 gallons of fuel just by adjusting the thermostat, that's a big deal, all right? And so the last thing we wanna do is then present that in an actionable you know, framework for you know, a busy, um, army captain to, 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 to digest. So we're not going to ask them to look through the time series. Can we just provide them a dashboard, right? So the, here's, our, here's our dashboard. And the idea is that if you look at this pie chart, it looks like Pac-Man, meaning that your consumption is dominated by one appliance. Go adjust that, right? Go, that, that's an easy thing to grab. Check out the heaters, turn them down, you win, right? If this thing is evenly divided by a lot of other loads and maybe they're loads you can't adjust, then that's fine. You can't, you can't change your profile. But in the case of the heaters, it's quite an easy thing to see they're dominating your energy. So before you roll out, uh, turn down the tents. And that can reduce uh, over 10% of your energy consumption. So um, that's kind of a, you know, a, a quick overview of what I've worked on. Um, and this can, we've applied this in residential settings as well. Um, and I can talk about that as, as questions arise, but um, I'll, I'll be done and let, uh, let Pete uh, take it away. Thanks, John. Thanks. We're over to you, Pete. Hi. Um, yeah. So when I came to Cal Poly, um, I was doing nanotech research and um, buying a house is what changed it all for me. Um, and so I'm going to talk about what happened with the house as all of a sudden I felt responsible for the choices that I would make because I own the house. And so it's a small house. It's about 700 square feet with a 400 square foot annex. Here's the front. And here's the south, um, the south, which is the back. And so um, if you recognize this is where all the good sun comes from, we want a lot of windows there so that the winter sun at high angles can come in and warm the house. And so this is what the house looked like when we bought it. And this is what it looks like now. So we put in all these windows and this is what it looks like in the summertime, the deciduous trees cover the windows and in the winter, we get a lot of good sunlight to warm the house. On the west, on the southwest, uh, that gets really beaten quite a bit in the summer, we planted trees uh, that are growing up and will form a uh, kind of a green roof with the roots in the ground so you don't have any of the problems with dirt on your, your roof uh, if you want a green roof. And so, that, for instance, this fig tree on the south side creates a very cool space where it once was unbearably hot. But you have to be careful. You plant trees too close to the house and you crack your foundation. So I, uh, I dug down and chopped the roots under the house and laid some more concrete and rebar. And so how do all these windows change the living space? I mean, incredibly, what used to be very cold and dark now becomes the living center. We have two uh, queen size beds and a trapeze and it's the playground, the library, the entertainment center the dojo and the shop. And up top, uh, those windows, we put those in as well. We took out the ceiling and what was once very dark and cold, now gets very strong sunlight in the winter time and uh, really changes the character of the house and defines a super nice space for a girl to have a room. And so we don't have to heat things too much in San Luis Obispo. We get a frost every so often, but um, when we do, we can make use of the fact that this south facing corner of the house goes up to 120 Fahrenheit in the middle of the day, even on the coldest days because of all the sun. So we, um, we can pump this air right into the house with this polycarbonate greenhouse glass and a uh, um, insulated duct 
duct fan. And so the other thing we can look at with the ground plan is, you know, what's uphill because that determines where the wastewater can, um, can flow. So, you know, we have to get rid of our wastewater, but it's all very good for the plants. And so I put in this branched gray water system where the, uh, the wastewater comes out and branches and ends in these, uh, that, that's the main house and the annex and ends in these plastic receptacles, which I cover and we put, uh, these are pepper plants next to it that I'll never need to water because they're next to the receptacle. A poop as well is something that represents a considerable societal expense and yet it's a great resource. And so we put in, my daughter and I built this uh, bucket toilet and uh, it's the urine that smells bad. And so you put in a urine diverter and the urine goes right out in with the gray water right onto the plants and the poop we cover up with um, with leaves so it doesn't smell too bad. It's very important you make a good seal right here because you don't want flies breeding in your poop and climbing out onto your food. And so here we uh, exiled the toilet and we can compost the poop with all of the vegetable matter in the, in the house or from the yard and, and the house. And if you do it right, it'll go up really hot and kill all of the pathogens. Here you see the uh, uh, the condensate from, from the um, compost. So 10 years go by and I have a full disclosure. A couple months ago, I put this in. It was hard, but now my partner, uh, my little girl who made it with me is a teenager and won't bring, won't bring anyone home. And so we put in a flush toilet and you know, you realize you take for granted 10 years of having complete control over where the poop goes, but We'll take anyway. I don't use that toilet. I use this one out in the shower. We have uh, some thermal solar panels that a photovoltaic cell uh, circulates a pump so that we can store the hot water during the day in, in a tank and then use it at night. And so it's really great going out 40 degrees in February and you get hit with that 140 degree water. Super. My daughter always liked a bath, so we put that in. And then it occurred to me, I don't know, maybe six, seven years ago, that I, I go through a lot of effort to raise plants that don't give me any food. So we had this, this massive genocidal push to kill all the ornamentals and replace them with, with uh, things we could eat, like um, citrus, blackberries, guava. And um, we got a lot of stone fruit. It's great. We have pears growing up the west wall. And in the front, this is what the front used to look like with the green roof, uh, the, the green colored roof. And now we have a white roof. And we have a lot of different fruits that we can eat that we grow. Um, this is that really hot corner. In the winter, we get sunlight. In the summer, we get peaches. Uh, grapes are the same. They're deciduous and they're super great. Uh, passion fruit, we, we make so much passion fruit jam. It's super good food. So you don't have to kill all your ornamentals because you can graft, for instance, on this ornamental plum, we actually get plums now and peaches and different kinds of stone fruit from it. Same with the citrus, three different kinds of citrus that we have growing on the tree. So we, we have a lot of uh, animals now because we, after five years of having no pesticides and fertilizers, the animals came in and, and that's a lot of fun, um, but sometimes not so much. Like the humans were late to the table this morning. I took this this morning. So we only got one guava. And I share this with my kids because I want them to learn, you know, about how we can uh, minimize our energy needs and make food, recycle our nutrients. And the tree grows in time as the little boy does with the people that have lived with us. And uh, this year we actually got macadamia nuts on that macadamia nut tree. And when a friend asked if she can live in the backyard in the teepee. You might say why, but you might say why not. And, um, and so it's fun to have people come in and out of your life and share the, um, you know, the projects. So grass is interesting though, because grass represents, it's the largest irrigated crop. And uh, we harvest it, we fertilize it, harvest it, water it, and then put it in landfill often. And so what do you do about that? Well, you can do nothing and nature takes care of it but you can also uh, just plant a whole bunch of stuff and see what happens. And so the Demania did well. And so we tried that. This is our wedding in our backyard. 
but this, uh, I took this from a neighbor. I don't even know what it's called, but this was the most successful. This is in the summer when it gets dry and the winter it, it is rejuvenated with the water. And we look at our, um, our effect as consumers. You know, we, I try to talk to the kids about, you know, where does our things come from and where do they go? And my daughter said, you know, dad, I know we don't buy stuff, but I want this sofa. So it took a trip across town and ended up in my daughter's loft. Um, this is a great Easter basket. And when we get rid of things, we try to do so in a way that others can use them. We have a free box in San Luis Obispo. Bicycling is super great. Uh, exercise, transportation, adventure, a way to be with the family. And the hot tub was tough for me for a while um, in trying to reconcile that I'm an environmental activist and I study energy and yet we have this hot tub and I tried different ways to heat it, but ultimately I said, look, you know, let's just throw some polywogs in there and then the kids have a lot of fun with it. And I'm also the advisor for the aquaponics club at Cal Poly. So we threw some bass, tilapia and catfish in there and we have a hydroponics unit now. And there's always learning going on. And so this is the last set of slides is, um, we eat a lot of beans. So if, if you cook, beans for you know the day or for many hours, that's a lot of energy. And so we, we bring four pounds of beans to a boil and that's probably enough for close to a month, that's a couple of weeks. We bring them to a boil and then wrap them up and throw them in the hot box and they never burn, they're always done and we use very little energy. And so it was no great stretch to say, well, what about if we just put in a, um, an immersion heater into the pot and hooked it to a low wattage solar panel, and it would take all day to get hot, but it would cook by the end of the day and you'd have really good food. And so was born the insulated solar electric cooking that we took to Uganda and I published with uh, 11 students at Cal Poly and represents our research. And so this to me is special because it's about a lot of things that I didn't talk about is that, you know, you have people who are studying energy and they often don't use it at home. and and bringing and you know destroying the boundaries between my research, my classes, and my home. I, I bring my students home all the time. Um, really creates a synergy that has been really great for me professionally and and for the family. So that's what it used to be. Thanks. That's it. Okay. Thanks, Pete. Um, so to really fascinating uh, presentations. So I'm going to move on to the Q&A. And again, um, please feel free to, uh, if, you, if you have any questions, um, type them out into the little Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and hopefully we'll get to all of them. Um, so the first comes from, is this from Peter? I don't know. Um, is this, Pete, not for me. That's not you, or it is you. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, it's not you. Okay, John. Uh, it says it's so. It's a question for John. Um, I missed how you could determine how a particular transient was from a water pump. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a, the trick about a ten-minute presentation. We're we're we're, we're tight on time. Um, so the uh, the nice thing um, about um, the Ford Opera Base in particular, although this is generally true of larger facilities, is that um, your equipment operates, you know, in very sort of discrete chunks, and the uh, details of the power electronics or how that thing runs are usually, you know, different from other machines. So, in particular, water pump has a large inductive motor, it has a large startup transient, um, so we see a huge inrush spike, and then it has some reactive power components. So. Um, that will differentiate it from, say, a heater, which is simply a resistive element, and it will just have a, a square wave um, kind of power signature. Uh, and so there is a training process to it. The nice thing about, you know, the Army base is that the Army purchases the heater, the water pump, and they're all over, you know, in every place is the same. So we can train on that signature and then deploy it right away. Um, there's some more variability in residential and commercial loads, but um, still the fundamental power electronics and the way these machines are built can help us uh, disaggregate those loads. Okay, great. Um, here's one from an anonymous attendee. Uh, 
you're in gray water. This, I guess this is for Pete. Um, you're in gray water goes to your food plants and that's not a pathogen risk. Is that a pathogen risk? Um, I don't think so. Right. Um, first of all, it's not like you like, so, so, you know, you're worried about stuff like cholera, um, roundworms, uh, parasites. And so there's two protecting mechanisms here. And one is that, um, you don't have that in urine. And the other is there is no transmission of any kind of microbial activity from the roots of the plant through the leaves to the fruit. So you could take, um, you know, you could even take cholera and roundworm infested feces, stuff that you wouldn't want to do, but you could just take it and put it on, on, on your plants and the fruit would not have any problem with that unless the fruit fell onto it. Okay, um, Ragu wants a wants a link to your to your paper, and I'm sure you can provide that somehow. Sure. Um, the other, I mean, just as a follow up question to that, um, another folk, uh, somebody asked, and now I just missed it. No, okay, here we go. Um, Kevin Patch um, wants to know if you've compared your specific home energy use um, to the U.S. to the average U.S. user. So what's that? What is that? Yeah, um, I have because I do with my students. And so my, our, our energy use, our carbon footprint, I, I guess I'll answer the carbon. I mean, our electricity, we use almost no electricity because we just don't. Uh, my electrical bill is $14 a month for my family. Um, uh, our, our carbon footprint is about that of an average um, earthling, so which is about one fourth the average American. I'd say we we uh, produce on the order of sixteen tons of carbon dioxide per year for our family, as opposed to the sixteen tons of carbon dioxide per person per year in the United States. Okay, great. Um, and John, there's a couple questions here about um, people having seen like similar products to you to to what you were describing. Um, and one from Magda is saying that um, they all require cutting wires to install. So right. she wants to know why hasn't anyone developed this capability using your technique? Let's we'll talk offline. So <laughs> um, yeah, right. So uh, the, the standard trick um, is, uh, I'll grab one. Um, so, um, you know, these guys are a brand name. Um, and the, the standard technique to monitor a current is to get something, um, you know, like this, right? And you kind of clamp it around. And you have to clamp it around an individual conductor, right? So you actually have to split this open um, and isolate a conductor. If you, if you were to clamp this around the whole uh, bundle, you'd get zero. This is measuring the net flux which is, you know, the emperor's law has got, you know, the current coming into your house generates a magnetic field this way, and the same current leaves it during exactly the opposite field. And so when you measure the whole thing around, you get exactly zero, or at least you should, unless you have some other electrical issue. Um, and so there are a lot of, you know, things where you can say, hey, it's non-contact, right? Um, but in, in fact, it, it's very much contact that you have to split this conductor open, it, this bundle of wires apart um, and, and grab them, which is uh, a very, <laughs> very poor choice to do on, on a live wire. Um, the uh, things we've developed, we actually we just actually yesterday the patent came through. So uh, there's some intellectual property that's managed by um, MIT now. Uh, but the, th the, th the theory is that the, the total field is zero uh, if you were to integrate, but it, there's small dipoles around the uh, you know, positive and negative around here. And so if you measure in multiple points, we can figure out um, essentially a linear algebra, um, the matrix to, to convert uh, the magnetic field back into the currents. And that's uh, I have some papers on that if people are interested in it. Okay, and another question for you, John. Alice wants to know, um, is, you know are there plans to com commercialize your sensor? Um, sounds like there are. And could this be applied to K through 12 schools? So, sorry, could it be applied to who? K through 12 schools, I guess. Oh yeah, no. okay, sure. Um, so that's a, that's a great question. Uh, the, the commercial thing is, is, is a tricky one, so I'll, I'll pass there, but um, I'm always interested in, in, in applying it. Um, I'm not, it's MIT's uh, patent at, at this point, and um, 
I'm not supposed to, we'll just leave it at that. So, um, it, but, but certainly with the schools, um, we actually installed it at College Elementary School, um, which is a school in Sharon, as part of their um, elementary school kind of uh, energy awareness um, to say, hey, different seasons, what are we doing, right? So that was for the younger students. And then going up in the grades, like, hey, if we get some of this data, can we figure out what the average power is? Can we figure out standard deviation? So some kind of you know, um, statistics pieces. And then in the middle schools, I think they were even introducing some STEM kind of programming concepts. Like if the power goes up this high, then light up this light or let us know, right? Um, and, uh, and it's great. So this thing is actually coupled with a web framework that I designed. Um, and just so you see that I eat my own dog food, um, <laughs> so to speak, this is a power uh, monitor in my house. Um, let's see if I can do this uh, right. Uh, desktop. Here we go. Um, so this is a live update right now uh, from my house, and you can see that uh, <laughs> this is not Pete. This is not good. Um, that someone left their Keurig uh, coffee maker on, and that's the orange pulse is continuing to keep that uh, reservoir of water hot. So I'll have to take care of that when I go home. Um, but uh, but yeah, so you can um, interact with this data um, as a homeowner, or if you put it in a facility, it can certainly help um, as an educational mission too. Okay. Um, and James wants to know what charting charting tools uh, are used to do this analysis, and also are you using any cloud-based platforms to do these analyses? Great questions. Yeah. So uh, this, I guess, if you're still seeing my screen, this is the website. You're welcome to go to it. Um, I, I wrote all this code. Um, so there's the, the start, charting software is is is, uh, is Donald Donald Inc. Um, the JavaScript package, if in, in particular, if you're interested, is, is derived from Flot, which um, is a, is a open source tool, but heavily customized. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can go to this website, and um, if you'd like, I'd be happy to. If you want to uh, account, you can see some of the data sets. So all the data is distributed; none of it's centralized in a cloud, right? So this is very the opposite, right? So it, I guess I started this research from a very academic perspective of let's see how much we can learn about a facility from the energy monitoring, and it turns out you can learn way too much. Right, to the point where it becomes a privacy concern. Uh, so now my research is really focused on how can we decentralize the processing so we don't rely on the cloud. So Amazon never knows this information. And this is a dialogue between me and my home. Um, and so I, I don't want to get digress too far, but we, we do use cloud routing right, to, to establish the connection, but it's an encrypted link between you and the sensor. And we try to avoid the current IoT model of a centralized data storage. OK, interesting. Um... Pete, uh, Rule, I, I hope, sorry for mispronouncing um, this person's name, Rule Litter, Little wants to know how many years of trial and error, um, or she says you have a lot of years of trial and error, which she thinks is remarkable, um, but she wants to know how you imagine scaling your knowledge, especially the long term, for the long term nature uh, of your efforts. Yeah, so, um... That's a, that's a good question. You know, um, a lot of it was just about learning. I'm an academic and I learn and my students learn and my family learns. I'm not exploring a technology for the United States to be using bucket toilets, for instance. Right? But one of the things that I tell my students when they come and they visit my house uh, as part of their class is, is, you know, we have a lot of, I mean, the one thing that is scalable universally, is we have a set perceived, there's assumed, there's assumed necessities in the way we live, right? We have to do things this way. We have to have a car because I need to get to work. Um, and you can question those and you can try things out. And, you know, I have a couple of very glorious failures that I tried something out and, you know, it, it didn't work. Um, in particular, the different technologies that might come for this, for instance, um, my research is, you know, largely about energy and poverty mitigation in the, you know, for the global poor. And so with our collaborator in, in Uganda, um, you know, one of the things he said once was, you know, you can smell the poop when you walk into a village in Uganda because they, they just, um, they just use the bushes in the area. And, and I said, well, you know, how about we try composting? You know, I, I mean, it'll be a much healthier, safer and, uh, and so, you know, when I go into a place and people say, well, you know, we want your technology, I, I can say, look, I did this for a decade and it works fine. Like, let's give it a try. And the same with the, um, 
the same with the insulated solar electric cooking. I mean, that's how we cook our, that's like, that's how we cook our dinner if we eat something big. Hmm. Okay. Um, and here's a, another question from Magda, Madga. Uh, again, I'm sorry that I'm completely mispronouncing people's names, but um, this is for, again, for you, Pete. Um, and she wants to know, well, she says China now has over 100 million home biogenerators where yeah. the methane um, from the compost is collected and used for cooking. So do you have any experience with these home biogenerators? And if so, what are your thoughts on how viable these could be in the US? Yeah, um, my experience is and very little firsthand experience. I've had students make them and try them and they're tough. Uh, I visited, uh, like we have collaborators in, in Guatemala and I've seen a number of these biogenerators that aren't, aren't working. I know stories of people using biogenerators that do work. Um, you know, you, you have to, it's like taking care of a whole ecosystem. You have to keep the bacteria healthy. So you have to monitor pH, temperature, all this stuff. And so for the United States, I, I think no, on a localized level, it would not pay for itself. Solar, on the other hand, um, you know, is, is uh, the cost of photovoltaics is dropping by a factor of two every five years. It's happened like that steadily since 1970. Um, and so this represents a technology that I think is, is very accessible to everybody. I think that taking on a biogenerator is a little bit like getting a dog or, um, it, you know, I mean, you're making a commitment to take care of feeding something, making sure that it's, it's alive and thriving. So um, I think, you know, potentially in China, if they have the community organization and they have the real need because they've, they've cut down all the trees and, uh, and, and they, they have waste that they need to process, it, you know, it could pay for itself. I, I think it's pretty unlikely that it's gonna happen in the United States. Mm, okay. Um... And um, oh, I'm sorry, incidentally, anyone who wants to contact me, I'll send them, um, you know, any information they want. I also sent you the link for the paper. I don't know if, if you can make that available to people. Yeah, there's a couple, there's at least one person who wants to contact you. Yeah. Um, so what, I mean, this is another interesting question because the big issue for, for a lot of people is transportation, especially long distance transportation. Um, so this uh, person wants to know, do you try to take the train um, when Tom, time allows versus flying? Um, and do you have any recommendations for energy efficiency for long distance transportation? Um, yeah, great, great question. And that's something that we let kind of exist as an ongoing challenge for us. We do take the train sometimes, it's pretty slow. Um, it's inconvenient. I, I mean, in town, I, I bicycle only. Like we put more miles on our bike than we do on our car. We use the car if we go to the beach or if we, if we want to go to San Francisco, um, which we don't do very often. I mean, another thing is we stay home a lot when other people might go on vacations. And I mean, it's easy for us. We're in San Luis Obispo, it's a beautiful place. And so it's kind of like, um, I think of, the environmental impact as a cost, just like you might think financially. So very few people would go out for a fine dinner every night. But, you know, once a month with the person you really care about, you might, you might decide to blow a whole bunch of money. And so it's, it's very much like that for us. Um, it's worth 10 kilograms of carbon dioxide to take the kids to the beach for the day. Um, you know, that being said, I, I, I have a, you know, a technology side and I've done analysis for electric cars and, um, and other energy transformation societal that are not just about permaculture. And, and I think that, um, you know, the electric, uh, producing electricity and, and using electric vehicles will, will become very financially viable and, um, and, and that will probably take over a lot of the transportation sector. Okay. Um, John, there's a couple of folks here that want to contact you as well, and I'm sure they, you're happy to talk to them. But here's um, a specific question for you. Uh, Peter says he missed, he missed how you could determine how a particular transient was from a water pump. Okay, 
Uh, yeah, I feel like, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say the, the thing again. If it doesn't answer the question, please let me know. But um, so every kind of major class of appliance has a different kind of power signature based on you know essentially what it's doing. So a water pump um, has a large uh, sort of inductive uh, motor in it. And, and when you turn this thing on, it consumes a large spike in power and then kind of coast to steady state. Uh, and then while it runs, it has a heavy component of reactive power. Um, and so these things show up in the, you know, the sensors as different kind of, uh, you know, data points. And we can cluster these data points and build kind of machine learning models out of this to say, hey, I'm, you know, 98% confident that's a, a, a pump. And I know on this particular installation, the only kind of pumps that are running are water pumps and therefore it's probably water pump. Um, and that works particularly well in these, you know, structured environments like a, a ship or the army base where they have, you know, knew, knew exactly what they put in. And in a house or, you know, an unregulated commercial facility, it, it can be a little tricky. Um, now, that being said, a lot of times what you're interested in is not just, hey, can I disaggregate everything down to the, to the watt? Maybe I'm mostly interested in, hey, is the elevator going to break? Or what's the biggest consumer of energy? In that case, they really do stand out above the you know, noise floor of everyone plugging in their personal electronics. And you say, hey, look, at this big building, the, the HVAC system looks like it's you know, got low Freon because it cycles way too fast. Um, and so there's different kind of approaches to it. The, the, the generic problem of can I disaggregate everything from this energy signature is a thing called NIL, non-intrusive load monitoring. And that's like kind of a Googleable term. And there's a lot of people that are applying machine learning techniques to it. But I think in an applied setting, um, we can kind of narrow down the search space to, to very particular pieces and deliver actionable insights. Um, I've had a lot of success with that. And again, well-regulated environments where we know what the appliances are. Okay, and here's um, another question for you, John. Um, this person has a sense energy monitor for their house. Ah, I think a lot of people, yeah, yeah. Really not a lot of people, but, um, and they're saying it's been both successful and unsuccessful at discovering devices. Um, sure. So they want to know if you've tried any, and I don't even know what this means, but exogenous, exogenous data as a cross-reference for your to your models. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So exogenous data. Um, so since uh, great company, yeah, we we uh, talks with them periodically, and there's some kind of things there. Again, what we'll, <laughs> we'll go further into the commercial piece, but uh, good folks, they're they're using um, you know this kind of uh, clamp-on piece um, at the circuit breaker, and from that you can really get reliable current and voltage without training, which you know the system requires. Um, so I've played around with some of the sense stuff. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not privy to exactly what they're doing, um, but they have a harder problem in that, hey, they have no idea who you are and you want something which they don't know. Uh, and so they're trying their best to say, well, garage doors, people seem to have these and that's kind of a regular thing. So I think they're pretty good detecting garage doors. But, you know, if you have a, you know, particular uh, air blower, some kind of furnace, it might have no clue what that is and, and requires you to, you know, put some stuff into it. I, one of the research angles I'm looking at now is saying, hey, there's a lot in the power, but we're not enough to really tell you everything that's going on. So I think maybe what you mean by the exogenous stuff is can we put like other kinds of sensors in the house or use other data sets to sort of give us more insight? And I think that's a great idea. So in particular, we're looking at, um, you know, um, engineering facilities, can we put accelerometers in, in particular spots and measure the facility vibration and isolate, say, hey, there are five pumps, they look electrically identical, but the vibration is stronger in quadrant three, and so therefore it's that pump, um, and that can help us out. Okay, um, and similarly, uh, Mike wants to know if you've been able to identify parasitic currents or vampire power. Um, uh, he says that his yeah. energy company claims that this is a significant source of wasted energy. It is and it isn't. I, you know, so just by the term parasitic power, right, uh, it's not big, um, you know, generally a few watts. And that comes from uh, wall warts that you leave plugged in, uh, wall warts being like, uh, what is it, like, um, you, know, like, you know, these kind of things. So if they aren't designed well, they can, they can suck a few watts. Your Xbox and TV are, are just terrible about it because they want to turn on instantly when you want to play that Call of Duty game. It's got to it's gotta be right there. So they consume a lot of power in standby mode. Overall, though, your energy bill is made up by like your AC unit, right, and the big electric loads. Um, and I, I think it's good to cut down on vampire power. My sensor is not going to be the, the right tool for that because we're, you know, by measuring magnetic fields, we lose the resolution to, to find the milliwatt, you know, you know single-digit watt loads. Okay, great. Um, 
one more question, and I think we're going to wrap it up. But Pete, um, Keith Patch wants to know, are greenhouse gas emissions from composting poop better or worse than just pooping out in the forest or the fields or the countryside? Um, yeah, you have to look at how it composts. So if you have a good aerobic compost that gets hot, uh, you produce carbon dioxide. If it sits uh, in a wet bucket or something like that, it will compost um, anaerobically and produce methane. And I think, yeah, you have to look at what, what would happen if you just pooped in a toilet and it went down to the sewer and they deal with it. And my guess is by and large, they're pretty good at making sure that it, um, there's, there's very little methane that's released. But you know, the truth is I'd, I'd have to look at this closer. I apologize. I have a question for John, if I could ask. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. John, you, your, tech, your technology, I, I love it. Um, I imagine it represents a very um, compelling technology for the military for re reconnaissance. Uh, they must be asking you to do that. And it, if you can't tell me, or if you have to kill me, if you tell me that, you know, I understand it, don't, don't do that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you know, different people come with different things. Um, you know, generally there's three big areas that we look at for delivering value. Uh, first is energy efficiency and can we reduce, you know, the runtime of machines or the average bill of a house, right? And so that's, that's kind of what we talked about today. Um, the other big pillar is uh, maintenance. Can we reduce, you know, can we predictively um, maintain our machines rather than um, sort of per schedule or run to failure? Um, and then the third would be, um, can we detect behavior? Um, and that's a little, you know, dicey in, in what kind of behavior you're looking for. So Good things, I think, people look at it, nursing facilities. Can we uh, have more autonomous elderly care by sort of saying, hey, we'll stay out of your life, but if we see an anomalies, we'll, we'll send somebody by. Um, less clear scenarios are like, so, you know, Pakistan doesn't have any infrastructure except electricity, but we we're sure that electricity is going to these places which the compound is using the most energy. Um, and uh, there's that, I, although generally in those situations, you've got other tools you're looking at rather than magnetic um, clip-ons, right? Um, so I've stayed away from that, to be, to be honest. Uh, I'm not particularly interested in those data sets, and I don't, I don't think it applies. It gives you a whole lot of differentiated value. Mm -hmm. Not that people aren't trying to do it, but it's, it's not me. Um, well, thanks. Thanks, both of you guys. Um, I certainly learned a lot and then gained a lot more hope about the world <laughs> listening to both of you. Um, so on behalf of the MIT Alumni Association, um, thanks for everyone to tuning into this faculty forum online. Um, and thanks again to our uh, distinguished alumni panelists from the US Naval Academy, John Donnell and Cal Poly, um, Pete Schwartz. And if we didn't get to your question, I think we got to most of them. Um, Please, uh, we will, well, we're going to forward them to the panelists so they'll be able to get back to you. Again, you can tweet about today's chat using the hashtag MIT Better World. It's MIT Better World. And send any follow up questions that you all may have or feedback to alumni learn at mit.edu. That's alumni learn at mit.edu. So thanks again for watching and have a great weekend, everyone. <laughs>